Hi, George Moore for Civic Center TV. We are here at the magnificent Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital facility and campus. We're here in the atrium in conjunction with the West Bloomfield Parks and Rec Commission. We're putting on the Senior Health and Fitness Expo. And we're going to talk right now with Denny Troshak, who is one of the rec programmers. Denny, we want to get your idea or your thoughts on these, this type of event, how important it is for the community. Well, I think the uh, main thing is to get information out to the seniors in, in the community. Uh, there are a lot of services offered not only by the hospital, but other agencies in the area uh, that they're not aware of. And I think that any time we can get that information out to the seniors, it's, it's a plus for everybody. What are usually some of the main uh, services that the community asks of you? A lot of them are health related. Um, you know, we, we sit down with a lot of the, the different agencies and talk about, like they had today, about uh, tripping and falling, uh, medications is a thing, a lot of dealing with some of the pharmacies in the area. Uh, but there are some other services too, just uh, we've got some clients that are blind, uh, how they can get some aid and help complete some classes and things like that. That's where the area agency on aging comes into effect and some of the other agencies. Denny, as the population gets older, how important is it for the services that you provide as well as the others who participate in it? You know, as, as the, uh, the population is aging, uh, there are more, more people are looking for some more services. Sometimes it's only on a, on a part-time basis. Uh, you know, we talked today about uh, some of the, the apparatus that they sell here at the hospital. We're trying to form what is called a loaner closet where people may only need a walker for a month or a wheelchair for a month because of a broken leg in that, where they can come in and, and give us some information and we'll loan that type of equipment out to them for a month at no charge. So we've been getting donations from residents and people in the area uh, that no longer need the equipment because the family members pass away or they don't need it anymore, and that's helping supply us. Uh, and give this that uh, opportunity to the residents of the area without a charge. Now, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, I'm located at the Recreation Department offices, which our phone number is 248-451-1900. Uh, uh, um, and if they just ask for me, uh, they can get it. A lot of times our staff will be able to answer their questions, but if it's more specific, they'll get you back to me. Right. Thank you, Denny. Thank you. Since we are all about um, rehab and we always encourage our therapists would have me if I didn't talk about walking, getting up in Michigan especially. We have such poor weather but there's so many facilities now, even in malls, even here at Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. We see people out t touring just the campus here every day inside, get up, be move around, uh, even in the winter and the fall months when the weather is not so great, stay active, stay healthy, and always stay mobile and walk. You know, I would say one of the biggest things is, is learning how to ask for help, because most of the time people don't know uh, where they can find help, they don't realize that people are willing to give them help. Uh, and the help does not have to necessarily be for those caregiving tasks, but it could be for any aspect in, in your life. And there are, I tell them to look for talented others uh, who can help them. And so if you know somebody, for example, who's a really good cook, uh, perhaps once, uh, once in a while they can make a, a, a nice meal for you that you could put in the freezer for your busiest days. That would be an example of something that, uh, you know, that I would suggest. But there's lots of different tips like that. Most of the time our workshop is, uh, uh, the feedback is that we give really practical suggestions that people can start doing things uh, in a different way right away. Um, this is Dr. Danette Taylor. She has a clinical practice, been in clinical practice since 1994. She has a wide range of experiences treating patients with many types of movement disorders and dementias. She's actively involved in training residents and medical students and has been both primary and secondary investigator on numerous research studies throughout the years. Okay. <laughs> Good. She, I didn't have to read it. I take up all her time. But again, w welcome, Dr. Taylor. Um, thank you very much. Um, as uh, introduced, I'm Danette Taylor. I am one of the neurologists. I see patients upstairs in the 
Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center. So many of the people that I see actually have problems walking, significant problems walking. I'm not gonna talk about Parkinson's disease specifically today, but I'm gonna kind of talk about walking issues in general as we get older. So, so this is kind of a picture of what a lot of us think about as we think about somebody that might be a little bit older. Somebody that's got, you know, a little bit hunched forward, using a cane for ambulation. And bottom line, when we think about ourselves, most of us don't think about ourselves as getting older. In fact, I had a wonderful discussion with a woman who was 88 years old, and she shared with me that she still thinks of herself as being in her mid-20s, and when she looks in the mirror, she kind of is a little bit startled more often than not, and thinks to herself, who's that old person that I'm looking at? So many of you may experience that same thing. So many of you probably think, wow, if I'm having problems walking, what's going on? Why is this occurring? And I, I broke the device. <laughs> I was hoping for a, a, a laser pointer and I instead got that little menu up. So how do we delete the menu so I can go forward? Perfect. Okay, so bottom line, let's talk about a little bit about statistics. I'm not gonna throw a whole bunch of numbers at you guys today because that's not what you're here for. But let's look at these specifically. Almost a third of people over the age of 65 have some kind of difficulty with walking. That's a pretty big number. So when we're 60, most of us can still walk very, very normally. By the time we're 85, only about a fifth of us are still walking in what would be considered, quote, a normal manner, end quote. And then what about falling? I think probably falling is a concern that we all have and something that we all want to avoid. How often do falls actually occur? Well, at least once a year for patients who are over the age of 65 and about 30% of people, if they're still living at home, if they're actually in a nursing home, more than 50% of patients are falling on a yearly basis. So we think about that and our natural inclination is to say, wow, well, so therefore as we get older, we're gonna have problems walking and we're gonna fall. Boom, this is exactly what we don't want to experience. So how many people believe that, that as we get older, walking problems and falls are inevitable? Yeah, not the case. Absolutely not the case, and let's talk about why, okay? We do know that as we get a little bit older, our walking can change. And in fact, if we take a quote, normal 70 year old and compare that 70 year old to a 20 year old, the 70 year old's gonna be a little bit slower in an analysis, a formal analysis of walking and ambulation. But does that mean that there's gonna be significant problems because that person's a little bit slower? No, that person's gonna be a little bit slower in most things probably because Unfortunately, that does come about with age, but a little bit of slowness doesn't necessarily equal falls and imbalance and gait disturbance. And in fact, for most people, if there is in fact some walking problems, there's usually a specific reason for that. And that's what we as physicians try to want to determine. This is actually just a very brief list, it looks long, it's actually a pretty brief list of the different factors that might impact your ability to walk and maintain your balance as you get a little bit older. Let's look at this for just a little bit. Heart disease, problems with blood pressure, especially 
a drop in blood pressure. Now, most of us think that a low blood pressure is what we're shooting for because we go to our, our internist's office or our primary physician's office and they check our blood pressure and they say, oh, we want your blood pressure to be a little bit lower, a little bit lower. So how could a drop in blood pressure actually cause a problem? Well, if you think about what's happening within our brain, if we're sitting down and we have a specific or a typical normal blood pressure, and then if we stand up and that blood pressure drops down, there's not enough blood that's going up into our brain. If there's not enough blood that's going up into our brain, there's not enough oxygen, there's not enough energy getting to our brain, and our brain's not able to tell our legs and our feet where to move and how to move. And so a drop in blood pressure when we stand up, something that we call orthostatic hypotension, can be a significant problem for walking on a regular basis and is in fact something that I see fairly regularly. Other problems, maybe you don't have arterial blockages in your heart, maybe you have some blockages in your legs. And if you try to walk, that leads to a sense of pain in your muscles. We call that pain claudication. And that can be corrected by a visit to a vascular surgeon or some procedures that might take care of those vascular blockages. Diabetes can affect our ability to walk well because diabetes can affect the nerves in our feet and our legs. And if the nerves in our legs and feet aren't working as well as they could be, then once again, we have a hard time maintaining our balance because not, we're not really sure where the ground is under us and we feel unsteady or unsure of ourselves. Sometimes just being heavy, overweight can impact our ability to move fluidly or to move easily. And that can be, be because we're not strong enough to move the extra weight or be, the extra weight causes some strain to our lungs and our heart and it's hard to move that. And so being overweight can in fact impede our ability to move fluidly or to move easily. Sometimes we see things as simple as a vitamin deficiency and, and we say that quote simple as a vitamin de deficiency. Often vitamin deficiencies are caused because we're not absorbing the vitamins the way we need to be, but a low vitamin B12 level can in fact cause problems with our ability to walk and maintain a good balance. Scary things like stroke or Parkinson's disease or problems with our spinal cord if we have arthritis in our spine that's causing compression on our spinal cord can also lead to significant balance problems. But on an examination, when your doctor examines you, those are typically very identifiable causes and we can then deal with that, whether that's with medication or with therapy to try to reverse those problems. How can loss of balance or inner ear problems cause problems with our walking? Well, we have to understand how we walk normally and all of the factors that take place with what contributes to having us walk normally. There are four factors, four systems that all work together that allow us to walk in a normal, upright manner. That includes our cerebellum or our balance center, our spinal cord, our inner ears, which is a labyrinthine system of the semicircular canals that keep us upright and keep us in balance. And you might remember maybe when you were younger or maybe you have grandchildren that like to do this now, if you spin around and that causes you to feel very dizzy, that's because you're overriding that inner ear system and that can cause you to wobble well, when we're young, that's a whole lot of fun. When we're older and it's occurring spontaneously, that's not so much fun. <laughs> but that is something that can be treated. So we need our inner ears to be working appropriately. And we need our vision intact. We can take away any one of those systems and still be able to walk fairly well. If we take away two of those factors, suddenly walking becomes much, much more difficult and it's very hard to compensate or overcome those deficiencies. So 
making sure that your vision is as good as it could be and corrected as well as it could be, making sure your inner ears are functioning, keeping your brain and your spinal cord healthy. Those are all factors in terms of, of maintaining your good walking. And sometimes medications can absolutely make a difference regarding our walking and our balance, whether that is because it's impacting our blood pressure or impacting our nervous system or other factors, we do see that sometimes side effects from medication can cause some problems. There are studies that suggest that patients or individuals over the age of about 70, the average number of medications is about eight. That's a lot. So, and if you're sitting there thinking, oh, thank goodness, I'm only on two, well, that means somebody else is on 12 or 16 or 20, and it is not uncommon up in our clinic to go through a list of medications and people are on a lot of different things. Even supplements you take over the counter can make a difference and you absolutely need to share those with your doctor if you are taking over the counter, whether those are vitamins or other supplements for sleep or anxiety or whatever those might be. But they can all play a role. So bottom line, what can be, what can be done so we don't end up just not being able to do what we want to do. And I think that's the one recurring theme that I hear time and again. I don't want to end up dependent or not being able to do what I want to do. The first step. Yeah, I know that's a horrible pun, but I used it on purpose. Because when you're looking at walking and balance issues, just like any journey, it begins with a single step and one step. So let's look and see what do we need to do. If you feel your walking or your balance is, is impaired or you know somebody, whether that's a friend or a relative or a spouse who has some problems with walking, ask your doctor for an evaluation. Let's look at the basic factors that may be playing a role. And let's look and see what can be corrected if you're gonna go get an evaluation, be prepared. And for any of your physician's evaluations, any of your doctor's visits, these are good things to keep in mind, even jot down on a sheet of paper so that you don't forget, because very often it feels as though we're rushed in our doctor's visits, and so to be able to have this written down and supply that becomes very helpful. When did your symptoms start? There's gonna be a different evaluation if your symptoms started a week ago versus a year and a half ago. Do you have any associated problems? Meaning, when I try to walk and I get off balance, it's because my back is sore, or my leg is sore, or my knee gives out, or I have shortness of breath, or I develop chest pain, whatever those might be, even if you don't think they are related at all, it's important to help write that down because that may make a difference. What is your prior medical history? And that all can be important. So it's always helpful to have a list of, of everything that you've experienced through the years. And it's easy to forget different things that had occurred when you were a child or a teenager or in your 20s. But believe it or not, those can be important to what's impacting you today so it's important to have that written down on your comprehensive medical history that you can share with whomever you see, whether that is your primary doctor or a specialist that you're going to go to for the first time. And what's your family history? Because that's also very important as we look ahead to what to factors that might be impacting you or affecting you. And then additionally, if you're having problems with walking or balance, assess your home. And this picture is maybe a little bit difficult to see, especially in the back, but if you look closely, a whole bunch of clutter, a whole bunch of furniture very, very close together, the ability and the pathways that are open to actually walk through are very, very narrow and very small. And again, this is an extreme example, but as we get older, many of us don't want to part with 
so many things that we've collected through the years and sometimes we do end up with some very narrow walkways in our home. And those are things that we need to look at and evaluate and, and perhaps look at very closely with some assistance to say, okay, maybe it's time to, to clear out some of this. So the second step, so you see somebody because you are having some problems walking, well, be prepared for some testing. And that may include an MRI, whether that's of your brain or your neck or your back. It may include uh, some blood work to look for those factors that I've just described. Maybe we're gonna look at your thyroid. Maybe we're gonna look for some vitamin deficiencies. Maybe we are gonna double check to see if in fact you do have problems with diabetes. There are a number of different conditions that we can identify through blood testing. So blood work becomes very important. And blood work that was done three weeks ago at your primary doctor's office may not have anything to do with your walking problem while you might be at a specialist's office. So additional blood testing sometimes is often. Nobody likes to get poked. We're not trying to pile on or, or repeat testing if, not, if, if, if they've already been done, but sometimes we do need to, to do a couple of different tests. We can do a gait right evaluation. That's a specialized test that is done here at Henry Ford, and there's a mat that is on the floor, and we have you walk across the mat, and that mat assesses, collects information about how well you're walking, what your speed of walking is, if there is any imbalance as you're walking, and that can be used to help determine what our next step might be and where we're gonna go. And then sometimes an evaluation of your home by an outside person, an occupational therapist, can sometimes be extremely effective as well. Can you guys see what that says? Have your eyes and ears tested regularly. As I've already identified or already mentioned, we do know that your eyes and your inner ears play a large role in helping your balance, keeping you upright, helping you walk normally. If you're not seeing things very well, then it's gonna be difficult for you to walk well, especially if it's dark or on uneven ground. If your inner ears aren't working well, then that may make a difference in terms of how upright and what your balance is gonna be as well. So make sure that you're not neglecting having your eyes assessed and your ears assessed routinely. And then what about treatment options? Well, it really depends on you as an individual because there is no one size fits all gait evaluation or specific treatment. Might be medication adjustment. It might be physical therapy. And this last comment, it might be the use of a tool. And many, many of us, as we get a little bit older, are very resistant to using a tool to help with mobility. Now, when I say, let's use a tool to help with mobility, what does that mean? Yeah, the, the dreaded cane or the dreaded walker. And how many of us think that if we use a cane or a walker, people are gonna stare at us? Or people are gonna think that we're old or infirm? My husband's grandmother, used to say that on a regular basis. She would refuse to use her walker. She had terrible back arthritis, spinal stenosis. She really needed it to main, maintain her upright mobility. And she would refuse to, to use it. And then she would go, she lived in an assisted living facility and then she would go down to, uh, to lunch and invariably she would fall down. And so finally I, I had to ask her why are you refusing to use the walker? She said, well, everybody stares at me when I use the walker. And I said, well, how many people stare at you when you fall down? <laughs> well, okay, I guess. So that was finally, she had to, to look at it from that perspective that more often than not, if we see somebody mobilizing very nicely with a cane or a walker, we just think, oh, good for that person. Versus if we see somebody that falls down, we think, oh, holy cow, let's call some help. We need to, to do something about this. So a cane or a walker should not be looked upon as an impediment, but rather truly as a tool to keep you independent and mobile. Can you guys see that? What is this? This is 
Johnny Walker red label. This is not the tool to use. Stay away from this walker. <laughs> exercise, 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 exercise. What can exercise do for you even as we get older? I love this picture. I think this is a great illustration of what exercise can do for you. On the left side, there are two sets of really what look like ham steaks, right? The top set of pictures are actually MRIs that were taken as a cut through the thigh and the thigh muscles and bones of a young person, age 40, who is a triathlete, somebody that is biking, running, swimming on a regular basis. The pictures below that are from a 70-year-old triathlete. Not a whole lot of difference between the two, right? But let's look at the right side. Picture on the bottom is that same 70-year-old triathlete. Picture on the top is a 70-year-old that sits and doesn't do anything, does not exercise regularly. Do you see the difference in the musculature? Those big rims of white around the outside is all just connective tissue and fat. And the muscles have all deteriorated because of inactivity. But don't let that discourage you. Why? Because even if you have not been very active, you can become active as long as your doctor does not tell you there is a reason that you cannot start some activity, whether that's problems with your lung or problems with your heart or for whatever else cause that might be. Studies have identified that even patients who are 90 can rebuild muscle with regular exercise. I think that's one of the most encouraging things that I have ever read as a physician that we can begin to reverse some of the problems associated with inactivity just by doing regular exercise. That's really the key, is regular exercise. That means doing something on a daily basis. Whether that's going for a walk with a loved one, and maybe that's not gonna be a walk on a beach right away, but maybe that's absolutely something you can build up to. Or maybe that's a walk in the park with some friends and this is a great time to walk, you know, here in Michigan, it's not too hot, it's not yet too cold, the leaves are beautiful. This is a great time to begin a habit of doing something on a regular basis. Now, there's a very bright gentleman who has put together a whole exercise program for actually patients with Parkinson's disease that he calls delay the disease. And his mantra is do something every day which makes you tired. Because if it doesn't make you tired, you're not improving yourself. So many of us, if we do something and it makes us tired, we quit. We say, oh, well, I'm done. Apparently, I can't do this. And then we quit because it made us tired. No, we actually have to reverse our thinking. If it makes us tired, that's great. That means we're stressing our muscles to get better. How many of us remember back in grade school how difficult it was to learn multiplication tables? And I know I'm going back a long, long way. But let's think about those nine times tables, how hard it was and how much time and effort you had to put in to remembering nine times six versus nine times eight. And what did you do? You practiced, right? Well, why don't we practice exercise with as much vigor and, and activity and, and, uh, and interest on a regular basis? Practicing times tables when we're in second and third grade is exhausting, without question, but we do it. Practicing exercise as we get older can be exhausting, but we have to do it. But we have to incorporate it 
on a regular basis. That means if you're standing at the sink and brushing your teeth, I'll hold on to the sink and do a set of leg lifts, but make sure you're safe. If you are standing up from a chair, sit down and stand up again and do that five or six times in a row. That's a great exercise to incorporate on a regular basis. To stand up, sit down, stand up. That's a, a wonderful exercise, especially if you have difficulty with getting up on a regular basis. And as you continue to practice, who knows how great you might end up doing over time. So bottom line, it's not easy, especially if we're beginning to have problems, especially if we're kind of set in our ways. But is it worth it? Oh, absolutely. So again, first step, if you're having any problems, ask for an evaluation. Second step, go through the evaluation. Third step, make some changes. Hi, we're here with Lynn Brewer. She is a marketing associate with Elder Care Solutions. And Lynn, what else does your position entail? And how do you help the community, the senior community? We are geriatric care managers, which really means that we help older adults and their families with all the challenges that can happen as we age, because things don't seem to stay the same. People need a little bit of advice, direction, guidance, access to resources as they find themselves in situations that are unfamiliar. Well, give us an example. Um, sometimes people aren't sure if they're able to stay at home and age in place, which most people want to do, or if their needs might be better met moving to a more supportive senior environment. So we can sometimes advise people if one is clearly better than the other, or if not, explain to them how they could do both. If you wanted to stay home, we would need to bring in these sorts of services. If that feels overwhelming or financially not feasible for you, then it might be easier to move where you can get all that provided for you. How important are events such as this within the community to inform the community about services? I think it's very important because most of the time people are handling their issues on their own. Even if that older adult talks to the family, then the family might talk to the doctor. But outside of that, most people don't know what types of resources are available to help them. So having a non-threatening occasion like today where they can come and just gather information that seems most helpful to them is, is really a great idea. Our next speaker is uh, the dietitian here at Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. Her name is Hallie Saperstein, and a little bit about Hallie. She's the registered uh, dietitian here at West Bloomfield Hospital. Her primary role is to maximize the nutrition status of the admitted patients through diet and active feeding uh, modulars. When not seeing an admitted patient, she often practices in the community wellness programs. She completes her, completed her study in the field of nutrition at Syracuse University, and has since that time has um, had a diverse career. In her leisure time, she enjoys spending time with her family and friends. She enjoys running, traveling, and cooking. So, Hallie? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you really enjoyed your lunch. I saw everyone eating a very nice, healthful lunch, which is always encouraging and great to see. Um, I hope when I'm done talking today, you take away some beneficial ideas to maximize your nutrition status and live a healthy lifestyle. Today I'm going to be talking about a few things, general healthy guidelines, healthy cooking, and healthy food purchases, and then I'll leave some room for question and answering. By following these guidelines I will introduce today, you will be feeding your mind, your body, and your soul. You will have an increase in mental acuteness. You will resist illness better. You will have an increase in your energy level. You will recoup better after procedures. You will have better management of chronic health problems. And this can also help you have a positive outlook and stay emotionally balanced. Now, who would not want to follow any of these guidelines I'm going to talk about today? The USDA, has everyone seen this, the food? The plate, my plate. This has sort of taken place of that food guide pyramid that people have once seen. Um, but as you can see, that half the plate um, is 
promoting eating 50% of your plate should have fruits and vegetables, and then the other half should have grains and protein and dairy also. As far as your grains go, um, you want to, I'm trying to encourage whole grains. Um, look at your labels, make sure that you see that whole grain is listed as one of the ingredients. And I did notice some of the wraps today are the whole grain wraps, so that's also a nice way to incorporate fiber into your diet. The other thing is with fruits and vegetables, try to get yourself out of eating the usual apple and banana, and try to increase your um, eating different fruits, different types of fruits. Um, you know, every week try a new one just to incorporate different vitamins into your diet. The other thing is milk. Milk is very, very important. You need it for your bones, and you need about three servings per day, and that would be an eight ounce cup would be a serving. But if you don't like milk, you can also have yogurt as an alternative or cheese. And then five to seven ounces of fish, chicken, or lean meat. And to include these guidelines, I've provided you with some meal planning suggestions. Because often it's easier to see that, but it, does, it doesn't always make sense on how you're going to plan your meals. So I gave you an idea, a simple idea for breakfast, for instance, to incorporate the, um, the plate. And that would be, for an example, like a whole grain muffin, a, meat, a banana, and a cup of yogurt. And that would pretty much suffice for your breakfast meal. And then for lunch, Always make sure that you incorporate your protein, your vegetables, whole grain, fruits, and dairy. Just try to remember that plate when you're eating to make sure that you're eating, meeting all the needs that you um, need to meet for the day. As far as dinner goes, make sure that you have a serving of protein, and that would be about a three ounce portion, which is like the size of your palm, if you can picture that when you're um, putting your meat on your plate. Um, and make sure you have a variety of veggies and um, Brown rice is also a great way to incorporate the whole grains. And always incorporate dessert, because I think that's an important part of your meal planning. And um, a good dessert might be a yogurt and fresh fruit, because that way you're getting your fruit and you're also getting your dairy. And it's very important throughout the day to make sure you stay hydrated and move every day. Because remember, if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's very important to make sure that you do move. These are just some healthy guidelines to help you with your meal planning. Um, oftentimes we tend to use salt in our diet, but salt can be dangerous to our health, and so we wanna make other um, options available. So it's a good idea to try to use different herbs and spices. Um, Mrs. Dash is always an easy one. Um, Kroger makes a zesty blend. That's a great way to add flavor without adding salt. Plan ahead, read cookbooks or magazines to get ideas, you know, buy a cooking light subscription, just to give yourself some easy meal planning guidelines. Consider contacting your local community education center for cooking classes, such as the Parks and Recreation through West Bloomfield. They have a variety of cooking classes and it's a great way to be social and it's also a great way to learn easy preparation methods. Supplement your meals with healthy snacks. For example, smoothies. As you can see, we actually have a smoothie bar here. But it is a great way to incorporate the protein and the dairy and the calories that you need in your diet. Try to replace your unhealthy fats with good fats. So instead of um, saturated fat like shortening, try to use olive and canola oil to, um, and use uh, nuts and tofu. Those are all great um, ways to get good healthy fats into your diet. And choose naturally sweet foods, like fruits, and you know, try to incorporate those. Even if you do make a smoothie, it's a great way. It's a nice, sweet snack. But remember, you still need to have your favorite sometimes, so that's important. The next thing I want to talk about are the three Ps. This is planning, purchasing, and preparing. As far as planning goes, it's really important when you're going grocery shopping that you try to limit those um, trips, you'll save money, and you'll also be able to figure out what you're going to eat for the week. So it's sometimes a good idea to determine that, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to be home, I need to plan ahead, write it on a piece of paper, on a, the right-hand column and then the left-hand column, write down all the ingredients that you need for those meals. So then when you go to the grocery store, it makes your life a lot easier. Um, search through recipes, again, either online or through cookbooks or magazines. Um, sometimes 
When you're cooking for one, it's overwhelming, or if you're cooking for two, you don't want to make huge amounts, or you want to make things that you might have left over. So sometimes even making casserole-type dishes is a good way to um, make a food and then have it throughout the day, week so you're not cooking every single night for yourself. Um, as far as purchasing, always stick to your list and check for coupons as far as saving money. Um, always um, avoid buying the pre-cut fruit that you see oftentimes in the grocery store because it really won't last very long. So you want to try to buy whole fruit and you know, use that to your liking during the week. Um, avoid the single serving bags of foods. Um, it's easier and less expensive to just buy the big bags and portion it out yourself. And um, as far as preparing, you wanna, um, like I said, make foods in advance. And also, it's always a good idea if you can to freeze things. You can freeze things in individual containers and then all you have to do is you're kind of making your own frozen dinners. You just have to pull them out and then you can put them in your microwave. And you wanna be creative when you cook. So as far as leftovers, I know we often have leftovers, especially when we eat out or if we didn't finish our box lunch and we bring it home and we wonder, oh, is this okay for me to eat? Well, if you have leftovers from a restaurant, I always recommend writing on a little sticky note or on the package itself, if you can, the date that you got that. Use it within three days. If you haven't used it, throw it out. It's not gonna be good anymore. So. You have to be very careful of that so you don't get any foodborne illnesses. Um, minimize the fo time foods are kept in your danger zone. That means the foods that are kept out. So you want to try to minimize the foods to about two hours if at the most um, for being left out. Um, so if you're having people over for dinner and that food's been out for three or four hours, toss it because it's, then it's in that danger zone of not being healthy and safe for you to eat. And as far as those leftovers that you do keep in your refrigerator when you reheat them, um, try to get yourself even like an inexpensive thermometer to check the temperature. And you want to make sure that um, you reheat those to 165 degrees. And I have a little cartoon in here, and it says, we only invite, invented cooking yesterday, and already she's serving leftovers. So I thought that was funny. Um, and as far as your um, remembering when you, you know, you are what you eat, as that old adage goes, so it really does still play a lot of truth. Um, and I have a few cartoons here. And um, one of these, the one in the middle I like, it says, have you given any thought to sampling the tennis court instead of the food court? So remembering, trying to incorporate any exercise. I know that Dr. Taylor spoke about um, trying to incorporate walking. It's a social way to um, you know, keep your body active, and it's a very nice, enjoyable thing to do. Um, and the other one was our diet special is a fresh garden salad served in a burger, shake, and fry container. So I thought that was funny, too. So anyway, I am going to... Um, leave it to questions because I'm sure a lot of people do have some questions about their nutritional intake and um, thank you. When you bring leftovers home in a styrofoam container, is it or is it not safe to reheat in that container in a microwave? Not safe. Try to put it into, um, styrofoam is not safe in the microwave, so try to find yourself a microwave safe plate that you can always use um, that you might have in your cupboard or find a microwave safe storage container and then heat it up that way. Good question. Yes? Oh. Let me bring the mic to him so everyone oh, okay. can question. Um, I, was all, I was always taught that olive oil, even if you heat it, was good. And then recently I've heard the canola oil, that olive oil has a, reaches a different temperature than canola oil. Which one is better? Well, olive oil does um, heat up at a faster temperature, so it tends to, um, you know, you have to be careful when you're cooking because you can almost overheat it and cause it to burn faster, or cause your foods to burn. So the canola oil does take more time to get up to a, a hotter temperature. But both are good sources of fat. Both are um, great to use for cooking in moderation. Get my exercise. All 
Uh, what about soy? Is that any good? I've heard from uh, different people it's no good, and from other people it's very good. Are you referring to soy products or soy sauce? Soy products. Oh, yes. Yeah. Soy products are a great source of protein and um, a wonderful way to incorporate that into your diet if you're not going to have a meat source with your meal. So that's a nice, and it picks up the flavor of whatever you're um, cooking in. So it's, it's fine and it's great for you to eat. At age 92, do I still have to be concerned with all this? Of course you do, because you want to live to, you know, who knows when. But yes, you want to make sure that you're still eating healthfully and, again, moving your body so you feel good and you, you know, look like you're 70 like you do. So I'm not quite sure I'm believing that. So. Any other questions? Are there some good books, uh, cookbooks to buy um, in regards to diet and so on? Well, there's so many out there um, on the market. I always, I like magazines, so I always do refer to, say, Cooking Light because it's inexpensive. I mean, you can get, you know, a, a subscription for $12, and it would be for the year, and get nice, easy-to-follow recipes that you can incorporate in your diet. And especially a lot of the recipes are made and geared towards just cooking for one person. So I always do tend to suggest that. But if you have access to the Internet, Another nice way is just going to the internet sources and um, using that. Do we have any more questions? Recently, there's been a lot of um, flack about expiration dates, and there's been a new Harvard study pretty much debunking a lot of the best buy and expiration dates that we look at, saying that this contributes to manufacturers' profits and a tremendous amount of food waste in the United States. Can you comment on that? Um, I do, you know, with perishable items, I always do stay to, uh, tend to, you know, encourage you to stick to the expiration date because it, there is a lot of truth in that, and I understand the whole marketing um, issue with boxed foods and things like that that have quick expiration dates when you, you know, in your mind you may think that they're still health, you know, healthful. Many times, too, those items, um, if eaten past the expiration date or the suggested buy-by date, they may actually lose uh, some flavor. So I always do tend to stick to what is recommended on that box as far as keeping foods. What about organic food? All the pesticides are in the air, it's in the water, it's in the soil. Is it really organic? Yeah, many foods are organic. Um, I, you know, some foods are more recommended to purchase organic than others, such as, you know, strawberries and berries. I always do tend to stick to the organic versus a banana that's in its own little skin, so you're not going to get the pesticides um, absorbed into the banana, so. Anybody else? Hallie, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, we're here with uh, Ginny Jarvis. She is the Director of Communications, Area Agency on Aging, 1B Services. Now, what does that entail for you as far as what your participation is in this event? Well, our organization, Area Agency on Aging 1B, is a nonprofit organization, and we essentially help older adults and adults with disabilities navigate long-term care services and understand what programs and services are available in their community. So we came here for the senior event to essentially help let people know about us and let us know maybe how we can help them out in their situation. Jenny, give us an idea of the importance of events like this for the community in our viewing audience. Uh, as, you, as we all know, uh, Americans are aging really quickly nowadays. There's going to be a lot of those of us baby boomers are going to be 
in that category. The baby boomer generation is certainly coming into aging services and the 85 and older population is actually the fastest growing segment in the United States as far as percentage of growth. So yes, there are a lot more people that are starting to look and need services to help them remain living in their home. So, you know, coming to these type of events, I believe, gives older adults, even if they're not at that level of care, where they still may be living independently, but it gives them a sense of possibly what's out there to help them if and when they ever do need services. Well, Jenny, keep up the good work. All right. Thank you, George. Thank you. Our last speaker is Jenna Jarvis. She is the Director of Communication for Area Agency on Aging 1B, which is encompasses our area, and a variety of the services that they offer um, to clients in uh, Southeast Michigan. Jen? Good afternoon, and thank you for your patience. I know I'm the last speaker. That's often the hardest place to speak when you've been sitting for a while. Uh, my name, as I was introduced, I'm Jenny Jarvis, Director of Communications for the Area Agency on Aging 1B. How many people here have heard of the Area Agency on Aging before coming today? Wonderful. So you may already know what I'm about to talk about. So, so what is an Area Agency on Aging? There are area agencies on aging across the United States. There's 623 area agencies on aging in the U.S. Um, all area agencies on aging receive funding from two sources, the federal government and the state government. So yes, the last few weeks at our agency were quite interesting as we went through shutdown as a result of the, uh, the, fur of, of, of the government shutdown. So we, uh, it was a very busy few weeks for those of us that were still there. Um, what area agencies are is we've been designated the focal point for older adults in the community for a place to turn to to find information about programs and services that are available to help older adults remain living um, as long as possible in their own homes. And interesting, the federal government defines an older adult as anybody throw out an age that they think of an older adult when you become an older adult. You're, when you're 21, you can drink and... And when do you think you can start to receive senior services? 80? Well, they say the 80 is the new 60. So when you're 60 years of age, you are then what some referred to as the federal government as an older adult. So when I'm talking about some of the services today, to be eligible for services that are funded through the federal government and, and the state government as well, you need to be 60 years of age or older. One of the largest programs that we provide um, funding for in the area is the Meals on Wheels program. I think most people in this room can nod their heads and say, yes, they've heard of the Meals on Wheels. I spoke to a few people today who have volunteered to deliver those meals. And that is the largest program funded by federal and state dollars um, through, old, through the Older American Act. The Older American Act is a piece of legislation that was introduced in 1965 that essentially created area agencies on aging. The area agency on aging that I represent, um, we serve six counties in southeast Michigan, Oakland County, Macomb, St. Clair, Livingston, Washtenaw, and Monroe, and there are two area agencies that serve the um, county of Wayne. So what, what do we do? Okay, we do a lot of different things. I'm not going to bore you because we fund a lot of different programs, but we also directly provide some programs to older adults who are living in our service area. Probably the most utilized service that we provide is our 1-800 number. And if you haven't stopped by our booth to pick up a piece of literature with that 1-800 number, I encourage you to do so before you leave today. When you phone that 1-800 number, it rings into Southfield. You just don't have to pay if, you, if you, it's long distance. We'll save you that small fee. It rings into Southfield and it's answered by resource specialists who are certified aging resource specialists who have a wealth of knowledge about programs and services in your community that might be able to help you. So we will ask questions. We can, you might be caregiving. We have a lot of um, 
you know, individuals who have retired who are still caring for a, a mother or a father. You know, people are living longer, so a lot of people in the retirement years are caring for an aging parent. So you may not directly need services at this time through our agency, but you might be caring for somebody who does, or you might know of somebody in the community who is caring for an older adult who's getting a little burnt out, doesn't know that there might be some services and programs that can help them, and they can call us, and we essentially help them navigate long-term care. If someone were to call us to find out what programs or services might be available, we're going to ask a few questions. We are going to ask the financial situation of the person requiring care because that's going to help us understand what government funded programs they might be eligible for based on their financial situation as well as their level of care need in the home. We're going, to try to, we're going to ask some questions about their level of care need. What type of help do they need? So questions like that we may ask when you call. And we will then try to understand, we will try to navigate and help the individual on the phone understand what programs and services. Adult health care might be an option for somebody who's caring for someone with dementia, a place where that person with the cognitive issue can go for a few hours, a few days a week, or they can go five days a week for a full day if the person caring for them is working. There's Meals on Wheels that everyone's familiar with. There's a chore program that can help older adults who aren't able to cut their grass or shovel their snow anymore because that, as we've heard, just heard, is a large fall risk. Um, not being able to shovel your snow and not being able to keep your grass up makes your neighbors upset and then other things happen. So, you know, those two things are very important in maintaining and keeping up a home. Um, there's the home injury control where there might be the opportunity to have some grab bars installed in the shower in areas where you walk where there might be some fall risk issues. Um, those are some of the programs that are very top of mind. One of the caveats that I always have to say is it is federal and state funded, so there's not unlimited funding to provide help for everyone available. So depending on where somebody resides, there may or may not be a waiting list for some services. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, Jewish Family Services and, and um, the, I just had a, the other Jewish organization at um, Drake and and um, Maple, I mean, they're also an excellent resource. We refer to them quite a bit, and they also have a lot of programs and services for individuals of all denominations that they can assist with. So we really help people navigate long-term care veterans' benefits. We'll let somebody know about them, ask the question about whether their spouse or whether they themselves were active in war duty, and then refer you to the local county veterans' administration to see about programs that might be available. You know, in a lot of areas, we, we're very busy at this time of year. How many people here do Medicare, where they purchase Medicare Part D prescription plan, a Medicare Advantage plan? So there's be quite a few people. You might be starting, you might be wondering, is this the best plan? Should I look at a different Advantage plan? Should I rethink my current prescription coverage that I'm getting through Medicare? If you're purchasing it for yourself, if you have retiree health coverage, then we can't help you because you already have and you go through your retiree um, the administrator. But we have a program called the MAP program where we have trained counselors and staff that can help you just review and understand your prescription options or your Medicare options. Maybe you're new to Medicare, maybe you're almost about to be eligible for Medicare, and you just kind of can't understand the alphabet soup that goes with it. We often refer to Medicare as alphabet soup because there's A, B, C, D, but there's a few different A, B, C, Ds as you start to look at Medicare. So we can help you look at those options as well. So essentially what an area agency on aging is, is we're an unbiased source of information to help you make the decisions or to help you understand what programs and services are out in the community to help you, whether it be for yourself, for someone you're caring for, or directing a family or friend or neighbor to us if you think they might need some services to help remain living independently. So I know it's been a long program, and I don't want to get into a lot of really specifics. I'll be at the booth, you know, for a while following the presentation if you have some specific questions that you'd like to ask me. And as well, I'm open for general questions right now. There we go. We have any questions? I guess I do have one with all the changes in the health insurance going on now. Do you have a resource at your agency to help people out with the new Obamacare and Medicare? Um, his, in regards to um, Obama, you know, affordable, the Affordable Care Act and Medicare, there currently isn't any, 
any Im impact on Medicare as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Actually, there's been a lot of benefits that have been realized through Medicare over the last two years as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Um, there's no copays now in preventive services. Some of you may have realized that when you go for certain screenings, et cetera, you no longer have a copay on your Medicare Part B. That was a result of the Affordable Care Act. They're slowly closing the donut hole for those individuals who have Medicare Part D and fall into that gap in coverage. The Affordable Care Act is slowly working on closing that gap by 2020 at the latest. <coughs> so what's actually come out of the Affordable Care Act for seniors are actually benefits to Medicare. Um, if, you're look, if you're under the age of 65 and you, or you know of somebody that's looking for their insurance options, we're not, direct, we're not one of the air agencies that directly assist, but you can call us and we'll give you the name of, of one of the organizations that someone can contact for that level of assistance. I'm perfectly happy with my current medical and prescription drug insurance. Do I have to do anything and can, can I anticipate an increase or decrease in my medical or, or prescription if, drug insurance? If you're perfectly happy with what you have right now, you certainly don't do anything. If you don't do anything, it will just continue for next year. We didn't see a lot of significant changes um, to Medicare options for 2014. Quite often over the last few years, you'll see a Medicare Part D plan will go up significantly in cost or there will be a few plans that end, and there hasn't been a lot of changes um, for 2014. But you should receive your annual notice of change from the insurance provider that you work with that will detail any changes to your insurance, and the, you know, the few things you should look at closely would be, of course, if your premium's going up. And secondly, if there's any changes to their formulary in regards to what prescriptions, drugs they're covering for next year that you may currently be taking. And those would be the two areas of change to really look at. And then if you're quite happy with the coverage you have and you don't see any reason to change, then, then you just do nothing and come January 1, you'll keep the same card and, and everything will be the same. It's a fact that the senior community in the United States will be probably the largest segment of the population within the next 20 years or so. The baby boomers, the 65 plus, there's going to be more of those in the community than ever before. So it's important for events like this expo to inform the community of how they can take advantages of the services provided to make their lives easier in their later years. And we were glad to bring it to you. For Civic Center TV, I'm George Moore.